Covering music-related content of all genres, if it filters through Eastern Texas, it's fair game. Y'all bring it. From Texarkana down to the coast and Dallas down to Houston and everything in between, we are E-T-X Ross. <laughs> Hello, my name is Timothy Thomas, owner of East Texas Foundation Repair, located right here in Longview, Texas. If you think you're having foundation problems with your concrete slab or pairing being home, if you're seeing cracked brick, slanted floors, cracks in your sheetrock, doors not latching or sticking or not closing properly, you may have a problem. Please contact us at 903 918 3409. You can also look us up online at EastTexasFoundationRepair.com. We also offer drainage and waterproofing also. Again, Timothy Thomas, EastTexasFoundationRepair.com. Thank you, East Texas, for your ongoing business. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the ETX Rock Show with yours truly, Boston Chris. So we are sitting in the Red House in Hallsville, Texas, and a good friend of mine, and I'm a huge fan of this guy, he knows that. Uh, I've kind of fangirled over him from time to time. Uh, we have Don Woods in the house. Uh, phenomenal, I got that word right. Country singer out of Quitman, sing, uh, Quitman, Texas. And you're back and forth between East Texas and Nashville, and you kind of tour nationally here and there as well. Yeah. Um, so wh wh what are the differences, do you think, between East Texas performing here locally and, and maybe some of the clubs and venues there in Nashville? Uh, the, the clubs in Nashville are packed. I mean, they are standing room. And every time I play there, it's just like that. And that's one thing I can say. I mean, I, I'll play around East Texas, and uh, it's not always, you know, packed. I might play uh, locally, and uh, there might be 30 people, or there might be 100 people. Mm -hmm. But every time I play in Nashville, it's standing room. And you always feel like it's kind of an honor yeah, to, to definitely. play in Nashville. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, it's so hard to get in up there. You yeah, know? And it is. I, I know there's so many venues up there, and, and they all try to feature music. And, mm -hmm. and what's great about Nashville is they'll feature music from anywhere, too, which is, right. which is great, you know. Uh, and, and, of course, in the old days, Texas country was kind of frowned upon in, in Nashville. And I think that might be changing a little bit. You know, I think that, I hear that a lot. But I think in, when that is actually happening, that is with the, the, the big corporate uh, entity that's there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when you're in the mix of everybody down there, all the artists and the fans, they love Texas country, they love Nashville country, they just love country music. Right. So um, I think that's just something that, you know, for the big corporations that are you know, making that battle between Nashville and Texas. Because when you're there, we're all friends. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So your love for music was with you from a, a pretty early age. Uh, tell us about some of your childhood memories growing up on a farm. Uh, my, I had both my grandfathers love country music, and I had uh, one grandfather. He was lived out in the country and on a farm, and I would help him. And uh, he always had country music playing wherever he was at. And my parents, they were they were hippies. <laughs> they, they liked, you know, Led Zeppelin and all that classic rock, and I grew up on that with my parents. But uh, my grandfathers, both of them, were my influence in country music. My uh, grandfather, Jack Levesey, who lived in the city in Carrollton, Texas, uh, he was a uh, Memphis studio uh, player for Sun Records. Wow! Yeah, he that's, played that's with uh, Elvis. He played with uh, Johnny Cash. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. A million dollar quartet. Yeah. You know the fourth one? Uh, Johnny Cash. No. No. You already na named him. I did. Oh, you're on the spot, Elvis. Donalds. Elvis. No, it was Elvis, Jerry Lee, Johnny Cash, yeah. and... Oh, man. I don't know. Carl Perkins. Oh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I love the Million Dollar Quartet. Just the whole story behind that whole jam session is really cool yeah. to read about. So when did you, when did you go from listening to music to, to making music? Um, I always wanted to sing. I, actually, when I was growing up, I wanted to sing rock music, and uh, realized that my voice was better suited for country. Uh, it uh, you know I did it when I was uh, young, but then I had uh, children and got married, and all that got put on the back burner. Right. And. Uh, 
you know, when they first came out with MySpace. <laughs> okay? That's when it put the fire back underneath me because my sister-in-law, she called me and she said, hey, you need to get on this MySpace. And I got on MySpace and she said they had this karaoke thing on there. Yeah, I remember that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so she said, sign up for it and do the karaoke stuff. And I started doing it and I was winning all those competitions that they put in there. Right. And uh, so I started winning those and uh, so I went on to doing karaoke contests. And just went into the, every, almost every one I won and went into that one. And so, yeah. so uh, we also tried the uh, reality TV. You know, I did the audition for uh, America's Got Talent. Got on the show the second season. And uh, then I got knocked off, I guess, the second month in. Okay. And, so you made it uh, pretty far. Yeah. And uh, then I went to uh, The Voice. Did that one twice and uh, didn't ever make it on the show. It's like when you go to The Voice, you know, whenever you're going, they're looking for a certain genre. Yeah, they're uh, like a certain box. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, I just missed the spot every time. I went first to Austin, and they were looking for R&B because everybody that was singing R&B, they got asked to sing a song, and then they got asked to sing another one. Right. If it was anything besides that, they didn't even let you finish the and song. They're trying to find an R&B in Austin. What's mm-hmm. wrong with these people? And so the next time, the next time I go to Nashville, I said, they got to be looking for country music in Nashville. Right. And uh, I did do really good in the, in the Nashville one, but I, I, I didn't make it onto the show. It was down between me and this girl, and she sang a Taylor Swift song, and she beat me out of it. So, so what made you decide to try the, uh, the reality TV show route? Um... Was it just because you know you were more of a singer inside the karaoke yeah, kind I didn't of box, play. and you really didn't have that experience with the band? Yeah, I didn't have no experience with the band. Uh, I didn't. Ha- I don't know how to play an instrument. I'm just a singer, and uh, so it was easier for me to take in that avenue. Right. And after Nashville, I went, and I, I was pretty messed up about you know not making the voice up there. So I asked my. Uh, my wife she wanted to go to the Ryman Auditorium because I've always wanted to go there Mm -hmm. and I went there and the the energy in that place made the hair on my arm stand up so um, I wanted to go get my picture taken on stage so I went up there and it was like this voice telling me you know you gotta sing this is what this place was built for you know not Mm -hmm. pictures and I sang the grand tour and uh, everybody come out from the building, from the museum part, to come into the auditorium, and uh, I got done. And the uh, guy taking the pictures, he said, "If you're interested to know, uh, George Jones's place is up for sale." <laughs> <laughs> no, and, no uh, pressure, right? <laughs> yeah. So I got off stage and had all these people coming up to me and asking me who I was, and I just told them you know, my name, and they said, "You're a singer." And I said, "Yeah." And I said, I'm "Not you've got a band or anything?" And they said. Uh, everybody was really impressed. It was a good feeling. So it made me, uh, when I left that trip, went back home, I formed a band, got on Craigslist and got over these guys together and formed a band called Whiskey Confessions. And Whiskey Confessions blew up in East Texas. I mean, we we started, the, the story, the funny story about it is we went to all the local places to get gigs. Mm-hmm. Nobody would take and book us because they never heard us. Well, where I live in Quitman, you got uh, East Fort, and you got uh, what was it called back then? Uh, the Gateway. Yeah. The two biggest places right there to play in that area, and uh, we kept asking those guys, you know, hey, you know, we want to play. And it's like, no, this went on for like three months, so we're still practicing in my back room, which had a big deck and it was open, and people started coming out and listening to the practice. And the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We had over 150 people there on the weekend wow. listening to us. They had pulled their trucks up. And uh, finally we got a call from uh, the owner of Gateway, or in no, East Fort. He said, uh, y'all still want to play out here? We said, yeah. He goes, okay, y'all got to because you're That's killing my business. That's a venue out there too. Yeah. That place. He said, uh, we've been asking where our crowd's been going and they said they're going out to this place out in the woods listening to this band called Whiskey Confessions and 
He said, yeah, y'all got to come play so we can get That's right. Back. <laughs> got, got you started in the woods of yeah. East Texas. Literally yeah. in the woods in of the East woods. Texas. Yep. In Wood County. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where my producer's from. <coughs> She's yeah. from Golden. So, uh, so at this point in time, you, you're kind of going back and forth uh, between Texas and Nashville, trying to get noticed, mm -hmm. trying to get your voice out there. This is not a question on my outline, but you, you made me think of it. As, as a vocalist who who's, doesn't play a, an instrument, mm -hmm. how difficult was, was it for you to actually find the right members to insert into a band? Because a lot of times, you know, if a vocalist doesn't have an instrument to kind of lean on mm -hmm. on stage, sometimes it'd be hard to find legitimate musicians. It is very hard. has been my biggest struggle. I mean, uh, to find musicians and... Uh, there's some good ones out there, and you know the bad thing is, is that I travel. I don't just play in East Texas. Right. So, uh, to find guys locally that can actually that want to get out. Yeah. yeah. And, you know they got full time jobs and right. stuff. So, they're the weekend warriors. You know they're they're awesome, but I I need a touring band, and uh, but that has been a big struggle. And sometimes we just have to hire hired guns out of Nashville to take and fill the rows. Right. And, and do you use like different musicians for studio work as opposed to live work? Yes, uh, that's that's kind of like the standard in uh, yeah. Nashville. Right. Uh, they uh, we like on our album we had uh, uh, we had Craig Morgan's bass player, uh, Wynonna Judd's uh, rhythm player, which is also her son-in-law, and Keith Urban's uh, drummer. Uh, who else? There's a there's quite a few different players. And so this was recorded in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, yeah. It, was, it was recorded over in Cupid's uh, Studios in nice. Nashville. Nice. Yeah. So uh, you were so you were invited back to Nashville at some point by a writer named John Windsor mm -hmm. uh, with the support of Larry Wallace. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get the attention of men of this caliber? Uh, you know, uh, John Windsor used to live in East Texas, and uh, he lived over in Tyler. Uh, and he's a songwriter and he's really really good at he loves ballads he's a great ballad writer and uh, he had this one song that he uh, wanted me to come up and do uh, just vocals scratch vocals so he could put it out to bigger guys that were already made it right. and I was like yeah so I drove up there and I did the on the way up there he said well I got two songs I want to do and he sent me this other one on my phone so my wife's driving, and I'm learning this song as we're driving up to Nashville to take and do. And uh, the the other one he threw at me was uh, More Than Dallas. And then the one I was originally going up there was uh, Whiskey Melody. And uh, so we get in the studio up there, and I'm just going to be doing scratch vocals on this. And uh, I do Whiskey Melody, and I come out, and he was just in awe. He was like, man, he goes... I can't, I can't even picture anybody else doing this song. Right. Uh, she said, let's do the next one. So I get in the next one and I come out and and he is, he's just crying. And I was like, either I messed your song up or you really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he goes, man, he goes, I never even imagined it sounding the way that you put it. I mean, I wrote it, but you just made it yours. And uh, he said, I want you to put these on an album, and uh, that's when uh, there was my wife. She was out in the uh, lobby, and I'm in the studio. And the studio it pipes to all the different offices, so they can listen to whoever's in the booth. Right. Room. Yeah. And my wife, she said she's sitting in the waiting room, and the, all the offices and these people just come out of their offices. Go, who is in the studio? And they said she told them that's my husband, <laughs> and they said, Wow, uh, can we talk with him? And that's what created 90 Proof. Okay. The, the producer and the owner of the record label come up to me and said, I, I want you to do an album. And that's how 90 Proof got started. So you just went in for scratch vocals and you came out with an album. Yeah. That, that's unbelievable. Yeah. We so speak. do you write as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how does that work without, I mean, do you just write the lyrics? Do you hear the melody too? Or? I hear the melody too. Uh, it, it, it comes to me different things bring it on you know uh, yeah, sometimes it'll happen in a dream and i'll get up in the middle of the night and just write the hook down and then build it from the hook right and 
the other times uh, it, it'll come to a situation that's happening in my life or in, my, in, in a friend's life and and I'll build it. But so how, how difficult is that? I mean, without, you know, the, the, the instrument experience to kind of picture and hear that melody behind the lyrics. It is, it's hard, it, but it, when you get with some good quality musicians and you, you sing the song, they automatically know, you know, where you're going, where I'm going with right. it. So that makes it easy. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's really hard to build it when you yourself, you can't play. Right. It is. It is a struggle. But I ask that question because I don't play. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I sing from time to time, and I, I help out with songwriting when I'm asked. Right. But it's it's legitimately a struggle when when you can't play, and just strum something in a key or whatever. Um, you know, the lyrics come easy, but then when you you know, some for me, I struggle to hear mm -hmm. that melody behind it. Right. Uh, so that's why I've never written a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you talked about your album, 90 Proof. Uh, tell us about the album and what it means to you. Being your first album, too. Uh, yeah. Um, it was unexpected, and it was a blessing. Uh, without that album, I wouldn't be where I'm here, you know, where I'm at today. Uh, I had a good friend, Larry Wallace, who y'all talked about before, and uh, we were good friends for years, and we've done different business ventures together, and... I told him about the experience, you know, in Nashville, and uh, he wanted to go with me, and uh, he ended up uh, backing me on all of it. Wow! And on the video and all that, and uh, he uh, he passed away unexpectedly uh, a week before the CD release party in oh, Nashville. Man. So. It was, uh, the album means a lot to me, and, uh, you know, when I went to, it was the hardest thing I ever did is go to Nashville with him, without him, because every trip we made to Nashville, we were together that, that whole three months right. that we were up there, and, uh, but uh, the album is, is, you know, when we were in, in the recording it, and the engineer, he says, I get, a, I get some of the best vocalists coming through here. He said, this is one of the strongest albums I've heard in a long time coming through here. And that's why I named it 90 Proof. Is because cause they told me, they was like, man, I don't know if you want to name your album 90 Proof. Coming, you know, your first album might relate it to alcohol. And I was like, no, I said, it's not because of alcohol. It's because the, the engineer was telling me that the song was, the album was really, really strong. Yeah. He said, you know, you got to do a whole album for a person and they might have two, three strong songs right. on the album yep he said every one of these are a strong album that's cool yeah. so you kind of owe a lot of the of the creation of the album to, to larry wallace yeah yeah we uh we did a lot of the uh albums uh, the song choices on there together and uh i understand you've got a, a music video in the works or is it completed it's completed yeah so yeah. Well, what song is this for whiskey melody and where can people find this video? Is it on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Whiskey Melody and uh, uh, I think I've was, seen this video. Is that the one where you guys are out in the field or? or yeah, we're out like by that? a river. Yes. And, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yep. And it was at North Tennessee somewhere, and then uh, we brought the rest of the video in, and uh, it was originally supposed to be two days, and we did that in one day, 17-hour day. We started at 5:30 in the morning, and we didn't end till like 10 or something that night. So now that you're making music on your own, do you feel like maybe losing or not making it uh, to the finals of those talent shows was maybe a blessing in disguise in a way? Yeah, I do think it was. Uh, I, I tell myself that all the time because um, I went through the trenches just like you're supposed to. Right. I, I played the honky tonks. I took and played everywhere that I could play with a band and the struggles that go along with the band, losing somebody within you know a couple of days of a show and having to find somebody to replace it and and being on you know breaking everything down there's a lot of stuff i learned and one thing i've noticed that the reality shows is that some people that get on those have never been with a band they've never been through that that growing process and at that point in your career you had never been with a band no. or anything like uh, that too so so it, it's made me who i am today and appreciate everything i'm doing even more because it definitely wasn't handed to me. Right. Uh, I had to work and work hard, and, and you know the 
when you're doing this, especially we started getting shows outside of East Texas of Whiskey Confessions. And I mean, we got calls from the House of Blues. Mickey so you Gilles. guys are doing like different sets of woods. Yes, yes, <laughs> different sets all over the place. And some of the shows, you know, they still didn't pay that good. You know, five, six, seven hundred dollars. But by the time you drive down there, you didn't have enough right. enough money no. for a hotel. Believe me, I know. <laughs> so we would drive all the way from the other side of Fort Worth back up to East Texas, and I'm driving, watching the sun go up. You know, finally getting bed around seven thirty after unloading all the equipment. Mm -hmm. And that's the true test of, a, of an artist. That's called paying your dues. Yes. Yeah. Uh, being your own roadie. Yep. Yeah. I know how that is. So what drives what drives Don Wood so so much uh, on your music career? Fans. Yeah. Definitely fans. Um, man, fans and the support of my my family. Right. Because there's definitely been times that I was just like, you know, this is too much. I can't I can't do this. I got to walk away. Yeah, uh, because you know uh, it is a struggle, and it's you know, sacrifices financially to do this. You know, until you make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, I'll I get letters and, and and messages from fans on Facebook all the time. You know, telling them you know, let me know that my music has made a difference in their life, and they'll tell me which song, and that's what keeps me going. And that's got to be a great feeling. Yeah. I can't I can't even imagine. Yeah, um, just to have someone take the time to reach out and and say that your art has mm -hmm. has made a difference in their life in in, in any form or fashion um, is unbelievable. So I have a quote from you I read on your bio mm -hmm. that I found very interesting. It says, uh, "quote My passion comes out through the lyrics of my music, and my soul awakens when I am able to share this passion on stage." End quote. Mm -hmm. So one thing that stands out about you to me is how important it is to you that your audience is moved by your music. And we are just talking about this. Mm -hmm. So why do you feel that it is so important to be that relatable? Because when I, the music I grew up to as a kid, it took and related to people. It helped them through not only good times, bad times, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the music that would come out is just a party, 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 party. Absolutely. Life is perfect. Let's mm -hmm. keep partying. Skinny jeans. Yes. Get on the tractor. And, and <laughs> life isn't that away. I mean, we got we got bad moments, we got good moments, and we lose friends, and and they and we still need that music to help mm -hmm. us through those. Absolutely, situations. and that's what's missing a lot of the times in country music yes. today. Yeah. Uh, it's missing the message. Yep. So do you feel that? Uh, I mean, how do you think? Do you do you think it's because of the audience out there um, that that cookie cutter country is kind of popular do you think it do you think it's fans faults that they're buying that stuff instead of you know the relevant lyrics that country music was about in the past no because they don't know the system won't let them know i mean if we had the outlet to get our music out then yeah i mean if you're gonna we're we're creatures of habit so it, every day they play a, a luke bryan song every hour on the hour Mm -hmm. We can't help it. You mm -hmm. know, it gets stuck in our, our mental. Would you say that people are buying an artist instead of buying a song? Yeah, they're buying an artist. Yeah, because they're published. It's a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Is that... that more, or that more that they're buying what's being fed to them. Oh, yeah. yeah. The brand. Yeah, yeah the brand. They're, they're being... And we, we had a conversation <laughs> not too long ago, a couple months ago, with the Texas Country Music Hall of Famer, Gene Watson. Okay. And uh, he was on our show, episode 10. Check it out. Um, but anyway, he was telling us that it's hard to fault the younger artists of today because people are buying it. Yeah. Okay, so why should they change anything? Mm -hmm. Because people are buying it. But that makes it really difficult for a guy like Gene, mm -hmm. who's you know all about real country music. In yep. fact, that's the name of his newest album, mm -hmm. is Real Country Music. And that fan base is still there. Oh yeah, they but are hungry for whatever for it. reason, they're being kind of drowned out and choked mm -hmm. by what corporations and I call it corporate Nashville yes. is trying to kind of shove down people's throats. So how can that traditional country music come back and take the forefront again? Uh, it's gonna it's gonna take fan support and and we're gonna have to work hard yeah. as an artist. We're gonna have to take advantage of every outlet that we have to get our music out mm -hmm. and I mean guys like you and you can't take in uh, say that uh, 
well, that's not, they that don't have enough fan base, you know, for right. me to take and waste my time with. Right. You need to take the small ones, the middle ones, the big ones, everything. You got to take it all. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to get your music out. And you know it's possible because Chris Stapleton has proven it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a traditional country music superstar now, mm -hmm. Chris Stapleton. Another one is Mo Pitney. I don't know if yeah, you've heard of Mo. Mo. Yep. Uh, these two guys are driving that bus and they're showing the Nashville community that, look, these fans are still out there and they're starving for this kind of music. Yep. So hopefully that's going to open doors for people like Don Woods and, mm -hmm. and a lot of other folks all over the country that are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s that really love this brand of music and know it's sellable. Yes. You know what I mean? So, now I took notice of you last year because you are a huge Keith Whitley fan. Oh, yeah. And I saw all your posters from last year. You went on a tour, and I believe you headlined the tour. Mm -hmm. And you had, uh, I think you had Keith's son on there with you, Michael Whitley. And uh, it was uh, his uh, nephew. His nephew, yeah, right. Michael Whitley. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I know that you're kind of driving that bus of getting Keith Whitley inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. So I know you're a huge fan, but what, what gave you the motivation to, to go out into public with this, with this mission? You know, I was, uh, I was approached to by uh, uh, somebody with the Whitley family. They heard me cover one of Keith Whitley's songs on YouTube, and whenever they heard it, they got in touch with me and asked me to take and pretty much be the forefronter for this tour they wanted to do right. and getting him into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a big Keith Whitley fan. And I was Same honored, man. I mean, just uh -huh. truly honored to take and do that. And we went up, I think it was uh, July, it was July 4th, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And did a concert for the Whitley family up in the hometown of Sandy Hook, Kentucky. Nice. And met all the family members and uh, all the friends and uh, ex, uh, you know, band members and everything. And uh, they absolutely loved what we were doing, what we were about. And they, it was, th this is a funny story because they, uh, Dwight Whitley, which is uh, Whitley's, uh, Keith Whitley's brother, he was, at first he was sitting up in the stands. I could see him. And uh, he was listening and, you know, he was getting into it. And then I looked up again, he was gone. And then he was at the right side of the stage and he was just really enjoying himself, you could tell. And after the show, uh, uh, Flo Whitley came up to me, which is his wife. And she said, you must, you must really, really move Dwight because nobody has ever made him come that close and really get involved since his brother passed away and so that meant Dwight really really had some respect for you to take and do that and uh, he called me a couple of weeks later and Dwight Whitley he is a truck driver he drives fuel and uh, he called me and he said I haven't taken your CD out of my truck in two weeks Wow. and I said well I appreciate that he said he goes you just keep doing what you're doing he said I haven't heard a voice like yours in a long time and I was really really honored to have that you know phone call so it's, it's got to be cool you know I mean you, you connect with your fans you're you're really um, recognizing that you know you want that connection right and I mean you're connecting with, with uh, new fans like even Keith Whitley's family where they they're asking you to do this which ha I mean it's a huge honor yes yeah, yeah. I mean I, I know you feel that but I mean Keith Whitley should be in the Hall of Fame yes, straight most up definitely um, um, what's wrong with you people uh, I'm not afraid to say that and I know there are folks in Nashville listening so Keith Whitley get him in there please um, so as somebody who's uh, how long have you been doing this now so as, as far as a band standpoint uh, it'd be 10 years this year so 10 years um, what what's the ultimate goal for Don Woods? So how do you determine if you're a successful musician? Um, really, I never wanted to be the famous, you know, Luke Bryan, Jason Aldean's of the world. Is it just because you can't fit into the jeans? No, no, I could probably fit into <laughs> the jeans. I don't know if it looked all that good, but <laughs> but uh, you know, I just want to make a living doing something I love. I mean, for 17 years I did a job that didn't appreciate me and uh, never, I didn't have anything to show for it. And 
the company let me go because Whiskey Melody made it to number 15 on the music charts, not the Billboard charts, which would have meant something, but on independent music charts, it made it on 15, they heard about me, fired me. Because they said, well, you don't need us anymore. You already got number 15. I said, no, no, they, I'm not making money yet. People. Yeah. I said, and you, if it was on Billboard, yeah. I would have called you yeah. before and said yeah. I quit. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, I don't need you anymore. Yeah. Huh. But, uh, yeah. Uh, are there are there certain goals that you have? You know, certain places you want to play, certain people you want to play with? I would love to do a show with Air Church. I mean, I, I really really love that guy he's still country and he's swimming with nashville that says a lot and uh absolutely does. yeah but uh yeah anybody that's in the, the mainstream eric church would be the, the guy i'd love to do something with and uh, i'm a big big fans of johnny cash well and jennings george jones and hank williams jr Actually, I got two tattoos on my back right now of Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash. And then at the bottom, we're going to do George Jones and, and Hank Williams Jr. That's awesome. Yeah. That's like the Mount Rushmore of country music. Oh, right yeah, there. man. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, you know, as far as truly judging my success, I just want to be able to make a living doing something I love. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so we're going to do rapid fire with Don Woods, everybody out there. You guys should be used to rapid fire by now, I hope. I hope it's got you guys coming back. But for those of you who don't know, rapid fire is a 90-second would-you-rather quiz. And Don Woods has to answer all 10 of these questions or a hole in the floor will open up and he'll fall into lava. <laughs> so 90 seconds, sir, that hole opens up. Are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. All right, this is rapid fire with Don Woods. Would you rather have chicken or steak? Steak. Would you rather that? Would you rather Elvis or the Beatles? Elvis. All right. Would you rather spend a day with Hillary Clinton stalking you, or a one-hour lie detector interview with Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil. <laughs> would you rather boots or flip-flops? Boots. All right. Would you rather write a number one hit, but for someone else, or would you rather perform a number one hit written by someone else? Perform a new number one. All right. Would you rather live in a world with no problems, or live in a world where you rule? Uh, world with no problems. All right, would you rather wear makeup for a year or would you rather walk around with nothing on but a G-string bikini for a month? Uh, makeup for a year. <laughs> 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 would you rather have a rewind button in your life or a pause button? Pause. All right, would you rather go deaf in one ear or only use the internet once a week? Only use the internet. All right, would you rather wear only 80s clothes or would you rather wear only 80s hair? 80s clothes. All right, that's rapid fire with Don Woods. See, that was harmless, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah so now we know that he likes uh, uh, steak and, and what was it, Elvis? Yes. All right. So uh, tell us where people can find you, Don, on social media, internet, and stuff like that. Uh, they can find us on Facebook, uh, they can, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, is it Don Woods and all all those? Mediums. All of them, all of them, it is. But uh, Twitter, Twitter is artist Don Woods. Okay. Yeah. And do you have a website? I do, but it's under construction. It's dwcountry.com. Okay. So where can folks purchase Ninety Proof, your your new album? They can get that on Amazon or iTunes. Awesome. So we want to thank you once again for coming on the ETX Rock Show. All right, so where can people get booking? What's your booking information if people want to book Don Woods and his band? Um, you, the easiest way is to go to our Facebook page, the band page. Okay. And that's uh, linked up with my manager, manager here, Russ Withers. And uh, he'll uh, answer back to you and get you hooked up. And is there any place you guys won't play? Well, uh, <laughs> man... You guys have done the woods, so I mean, yeah, come on. Yeah, we, we definitely... <laughs> I'd like to get in over here at coaches and cowboys i've been wanting to play that place and uh and then gary uh he called me yesterday he's got a show coming up at the old palace he wants me to be involved gary in. jones yep yeah, cool yep. We, we had him on the show several weeks ago yeah. and that was a fun interview right in this room as a matter of yeah. fact yeah so remember you guys out there that are tuning in remember to always support your local music and east texas rocks 
Katie Kennedy, the owner of the Liberty Bell, located in historic downtown Nacogdoches. We would like to invite you to come on down for our live music, our extensive menu, including our brunch menu, available on the weekends, and excellent service. We're open every day of the week except for Monday. We've got live music every day and drink specials. So we'd love to see you in Nacogdoches. Come on down. Tell them Katie sent you. Hey, Nathan Honeycutt here with ETX Music. ETX has got talent is coming to the Gladewater Opry November 15th and we want you to be a part of it. The winners will be sent to Austin on November 18th to meet directly with the producers. This is not the day of the general auditions which is the following day. This isn't the same thing as the front of the line pass because there will be no line on the 18th. The winners of ETX Music's Got Talent will go straight in to the top producers. End of story. That is where the rubber meets the road. This is a great opportunity. Go to etxmusic.com and check it out. ETX Music's Got Talent. We have partnered with America's Got Talent and NBC Universal, and we hope to see you there at the Gladewater Opry on November 15th. Go to etxmusic.com for more information on how you can enter into the contest, period. You may enter the contest by going to our Facebook page. It's East Texas Music. Go to Events select ETX Music's Got Talent and submit your best video for our judges to select. If you are chosen, you will be performing November 15th at the Gladewater Opry in Gladewater, Texas. We'll see you there. We are ETX Ross! <laughs> <laughs>